Okay, let's get started, guys. Okay. Uh oh, spoilers. So sorry, guys. Okay. Um. Hey guys, hello and welcome to SIG AI Let's Talk Supervised Learning Part 3. So yeah, um, part one and part two is in our YouTube channel. Please go uh, look at it. We will give you some uh, links to it. Uh, we talked about, I think, yeah, um, we talked about supervised learning models, basic models, and then we also talk, we talked about ensemble techniques. So yeah, I do recommend checking it out. Today we're gonna talk about you know, networks. So yeah, um, I'm your host today, Bharatwaj, and yeah, um, that's my Discord over there, over here. Yeah, so uh, you can uh, DM me about anything AI or any questions you have. I'll be happy to answer and ha happy to guide you uh, if you have any questions on it. So yeah, and um, I'm also the co-sig AI lead with Hyro, of course, and this is Hyro. Yeah, and uh, Hiro, you have anything to say? Yeah, that's me. That's, um, I'm Hiro, Kosig AI. Again, I like anything data science. That's all me. Just come and ask me some questions if you want. And uh, just so yes, no, uh, me and Bararosha are coming back next semester as like co Kosig AIs. Yep. Uh, we just got elected last uh, Friday. So yeah, just. Just wait for next semester, more workshops and uh, different types of workshops as well, you know? Yeah. It's going to be pretty lit. Yeah. Honestly, we, we were looking forward for that too. So we we'll hope to see you guys in person uh, for these workshops next semester. So, but let, let's get started with this workshop today. So um, what exactly is SIG AI Let's Talk? So SIG AI Let's Talk is a, a place to learn something new, a place to throw away your fears of speaking out and a place for discussion. So if you have anything, just uh, feel free to ask me questions. Uh, I'll have the chat open actually, yeah. I forgot to do that, yeah. So I'll have the chat open, feel free to ask me any questions. And yeah, started with the workshop. Yeah, and this is the schedule for our Let's Talk and Let's Code workshop. Uh, Let's Talk and Let's Code are two different series of workshops that BS uh, Koya leads um, came up with. And uh, this is uh, uh, the QR code here is the schedule for our workshops. And we're almost done at, actually. We have like, I think two more workshops and I think one uh, competition coming up. So keep in mind, uh, it's all in the um, QR code over there in the link. And yeah, why do we give you this? Um, we, we just give you this to maybe come prepared uh, for some of the uh, talks, maybe you want to say something about it, or you have something to share. We this is a place for discussion, so you know, we we'll be happy to learn something. And I, I'm not that perfect too, so I I I really learn like to learn something from you guys if you have something to say. So yeah, um, please do go check out the QR code, and yeah, we'll get started. So this is what we're going to be doing today. So today's schedule, we'll be talking about neural network, um, and we'll be talking about a perceptron structure of neural networks, deep learning, uh, different types of neural networks, and a surprise in the end, we'll come to that. So st stick around and questions as always. So yeah, and one more thing, guys, just pay attention because you'll know why, okay? Yeah, so let's get started. So what do you guys think is a neural network? So when I say neural network, right, what comes to your mind like, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when I say neural network? Anyone? Yeah, just answer. I am here to... When, when, when I think of neural networks, I want to think of just like a bunch of scattered nodes that are connected somehow. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's, that, that's the best picture to have in your head when you think about neural networks. Yeah, uh, anything, anyone else? Anyone else? What do you guys think a neural network is? Like, when I say neural networks, what comes to your head first? And what is a neural network in, uh, in according to you? 
doesn't have to be a um, really apt definition. Anyone else? Uh, for me, I just think of like a bunch of graphs. Like uh, uh, every time I've seen like someone use like a neural network or something, it's for like uh, like a project where like uh, I don't know, like an animal learns how to move or whatever, and use like a neural network, and mm -hmm. you can see a bunch of like flashing nodes and stuff like that. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Kind of like what's like the background. That's that's kind of what when they think about neural network. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think uh, there are also a lot of YouTube videos uh, where uh, they show them playing games and then like a bunch of nodes going on. Yeah, I know. You're yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Okay, yeah. So basically what a neural network is, is, oh, yeah, this network of neurons. Simple. So when we say neural network, we usually, because it's a SIG AI uh, class, I mean, let's talk event, and we're more on computer science, everyone will think about the model, but here uh, I'm referring to a neural network in our head. Neural networks are heavily, um, th th they're heavily made looking at our brain. So this, that's basically how neural networks were made. And it's, it's important to know why it's inspired from our brain in the first place. And we need to know how this works. So basically a neuron in our head is, it has three basic parts. One is the cell body. Uh, yeah, let me get my label here. So this is a cell body over here. And these are the dendrites. And this is the axon. Let's not get into too much of detail. I know that there's a lot of things over here, but we don't need to go too much into detail of it. So what are, what are the, um, what, what do these things do, right? So the axon of, of this neuron is separated from the dendrites which is really simple to understand. And of, the, of another neuron by a small gap. So over here, there's something called a synapse, right? This gap is called the synapse. And it's just, a, it's just an empty space, okay? And neurons talk to each other by passing electrical signals through these synapses. And let's, let, let, let's talk about how they send these electrical signals, right? So one neuron receives signal from another neuron. So over here, these dendrites are also connected to other neurons, right? And what happens is that it keeps getting electrical signals from all these different neurons that it's connected to. And what happens is the electrical signal starts building up in the cell body over here. And once it reaches a certain threshold, it releases the electrical energy and it flows through the axon and then it goes through, it goes to another neuron and the process repeats again. This is basically how neurons work in our head. And you see here, a bunch of neurons having some party. So yeah, uh, that's, that's basically how a neural network works. And now let's talk about a perceptron. Yeah, perceptron is the first artificial neuron, not neural network, but a neuron. So let's look into the history of a perceptron. So in 1958, Frank Rosenblatt was inspired by the Dartmouth Conference. Uh, the Dartmouth Conference, yeah, Dartmouth Conference was uh, actually hosted by John McCarthy, uh, who is well known in the field of AI. And he wanted to create an artificial neural network after, after attending that Dartmouth confer uh, Conference. And his goal was to classify images with supervision, right? Supervision means supervised learning. Remember, we learned that. But, but what kind of images, right? Triangles. What, what else? So yeah, so he wanted to uh, classify triangles and shapes that are not triangles. In fact, weird shape. So there's Gary over here. Gary is weird, right? So he's a weird shape. So now let's see the working of a perceptron. This is really important. So working of a perceptron, uh, working of a perceptron is basically like how we how a neuron works, right? So what Frank did was he used a 400 pixel camera. Like it's so crazy that we're, we have come so far, right? Now we're talking about megapixels and then so far back it's just pixel. Yeah, four pixel, 400 pixel camera, right? And he used different electrical signals uh, to, okay, so the what, what the camera did was it sent different electrical signals when a pixel had either ink or paper. So let's say the pixel value over here, uh, it, it, it's a paper, right? It's white. So it would send a, it would send a, let's say um, an X amount of electrical signal, but if if the pixel value was dark, which 
which would indicate that there was ink over there, then it would send a different pixel value, which may be Y, right? So now these electrical signals uh, are given to the perceptron. Now what the perceptron does is it takes all these electrical signals and it tries to sum it up, okay? And it already knows what a triangle shape kind of has the sum as. Like, let's say I give you a three and three, right? And you add it together and you say six, right? And let's say six was like, uh, some, six was something that described a triangle, right? So if it is above that, if it, if it is above that certain threshold, if the total charge is above the certain threshold, it would uh, light up a light and say, oh yeah, I think it's a triangle, right? So uh, this is how it, 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 it tries to learn from its mistakes. But how does it know if it is right or not? Like it, it can say, oh, I think maybe a total charge of four might be, um, uh, might be a triangle, right? But so this is where uh, it's important to know that he used supervised learning for this. So Frank, what, what Frank did was he sat um, and kept, kept showing images of triangles, right? And then if a light blinked, he knows if it's a triangle or not, right? So he presses yes if it is a triangle and no if it's not a triangle. So there, there were basically switches. And what this does is if, it, if it's no, it's, it's a negative reinforcement, right? So it's like, oh, that's not a triangle. So let me adjust my threshold. Right, so it adjusted the threshold um, accordingly if it was a triangle or not, right? And then if it's yes, then it doesn't change the threshold. It's just normally there. So this is basically how the perceptron works. And you can see, uh, you can start linking it towards how a neuron works and how a perceptron works. Remember, certain threshold, it releases all the electrical energy. Same thing, a certain threshold, it blinks the light. So it, it, it means that it thinks it's a triangle, right? So yeah, this is basically how a perceptron works. And now let's move on to artificial neural network. Now it's important that we, we use the term artificial, but for simplicity today, uh, whenever I use the term neural networks, I'll be mentioning, art, uh, I'll be referring to artificial neural networks. Okay, I won't be, from now onwards, I won't be mentioning the, uh, the natural neural networks. When I do want to talk about it, I will mention natural. So yes they were inspired by natural neural networks, artificial neural networks. And artificial neural networks are basically a bunch of perceptrons. So what are perceptrons? Neurons. And what's a natural neural network? A bunch of neurons, right? And what, what's an artificial neural network? A bunch of perceptrons, same thing, right? Okay, so how can neural networks help us, right? One, they allow us to make use of data that might seem too big or overwhelming for us to use on our own, right? I'll give you 300 and, uh, uh, three, 3 million or 4 million images to look at, right? I don't think you're able to find, I, I don't think it's humanly possible for you to uh, find patterns immediately after looking at it in a very short amount of time, correct? So neural networks help us find patterns, especially in given so much of data. Right, so that, that's what neural networks really help us in. So let's talk about the first generation of neural network, right? Mention it. So Fife Li, I, am, I hope I pronounced that right, um, wanted to build neural networks to recognize images, right? She used supervised learning and she created this huge public data set of over 3.2 million labeled images. Well, you may be asking me, well, how did she label 3.2 million images, right? Well, she used crowdsourcing and she used the power of the internet. So what she did was she had a bunch of images and she also allowed you to upload any images you want. And then she only, well, what she said was, okay, yeah, label your images before you put it in, right? So she used, so when all of us work together, you, you, now you understand why 3.2 million labeled images make sense to you now, right? And one more important thing is these were, all under nested categories. What does this mean? So let's take, let's say you want a picture of a dog, right? So a dog would be listed under domestic animal, which would be listed under animal. So this is how all the images were listed. So this helps the neural network also make other connections, right? So th this is why it was really important. ImageNet was, I think, one of the first data sets of uh, huge data sets for images that was ever made. And second generation of neural networks, and this was the breakthrough for neural networks, was AlexNet. So Alex Krasowski, I think I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, so 
he graduated from the University of Toronto and he decided to apply neural networks to ImageNet, the one that we talked about in the previous slide. And before he did it, there were a lot of people who tried applying neural networks to ImageNet and it, they weren't so successful. Uh, they weren't able to get the, uh, they weren't able to get really accurate models and it was really hard at the time. But suddenly this guy, this graduate guy from Toronto, uh, from the University of Toronto was able to make this neural network and everyone were going crazy about it. So let's see why it really separated from him from the pack, right? So he used more hidden layers. We'll talk about what hidden layers are coming up. And he used faster computation hardware to handle all the math for neural networks. Yeah, and the the reason why he got so much um, so much fame and people started recognizing his publication was because he only uh, his neural network was able to only get three images out of ten images wrong, which was like a solid B. Where others were like trying so hard and they were scraping off with a low C, C minus in fact. So yeah, that's how good his neural network was doing. Yeah, let's get into the architecture of neural networks now. So what, what neural networks usually, what, what they look like and how they work, right? So basically a neural network has uh, three basic layers. One is input layer over here, hidden layers. So hidden layers, you can have either one hidden layer or many hidden layers, okay? So hidden layers and an output layer, okay? So let's get into more detail about each layer. So input layer, right? This layer receives data represented as a number. This is very, very important. And each, in, each input neuron over here, these input neurons are represented, represents a single feature. Like let's say height, weight, or uh, age. So yeah, it, it's basically a, a, a feature, right? A single feature uh, of the data, right? And this feature can be anything because anything can be converted into a number. Okay, we'll get to that. We'll get to that one sentence later. And each neuron sends its number to every neuron to the next layer. So as you see here, this first neuron sends it to this hidden layer, this hidden layer, this hidden layer, and this hidden layer. And this neuron sends it to each and every layer. So that's how uh, the input layer sends it to each and every layer. We'll, we'll talk about why it's sending it to each and every hidden layer and uh, why we have more than one nodes in the hidden layer, right? And Oh yeah, one more thing about this is remember we talked about machine learning models don't like anything but uh, numbers. Yeah, this is why. So we need we need to feed it numbers, right? So that's how it calculates stuff. Okay. Remember we talked about that images need numbers, but how do you um, how how do you give them images then, right? Does anyone know how images can be converted into numbers? Any idea? Anyone? Uh, if, could we use uh, it could be like a matrix where each 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 value is like a color scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's exactly how uh, images are converted. So, as we know, images. Okay, there are two types of images, right? Black and white, and color images, right? And most importantly, features are represented by the information of a pixel, as you rightly said. And black and white pic, uh, black and white images are easy, really easy to uh, segregate. It's like how bright a pixel is, right? So it can be a value from zero to one, correct? But for color, it's the amount of red, blue, and green in the in the picture. Do you see? And these are called different channels, right? And these channels can range between zero and uh, two, two to five, right? And you see here, the, in this picture, this is all the red in the picture, and this is all the blue in the picture, and this is all the green in the picture. These are all different channels. So uh, when you separate it, this is how they look. Yeah, so, and this can be fe fed into the model really easily because this can be represented as, each pixel can be represented as a number between zero and two to five, right? So yeah, this is how images are converted. So yeah, let's talk about hidden layers now. So hidden layers are the major component of neural networks. This is where all the computation happens. And you may be asking why they're called hidden layers, right? They're called hidden layers because they're not directly observable from the outside system. So yeah, it was just, it, it's just that the computation happens in that hidden layer. So it's like bound up between the input and the output. That's basically why they're called hidden layers. And so the hidden layers receive 
all the numbers from the input layer, or they can also receive information from other hidden layers. Like you see hidden layer two over here, it receives all the inputs from hidden layer one. That depends on how many hidden layers you use, okay? And each node in the hidden layer represents a different parameter. Like, and yeah, this answers why we need more than one nodes in each hidden layer, right? Because this hidden layer, uh, this node might be looking at the eyes and for image processing, of course, this, this might be looking at eyes, well, this might be looking at curves or this might be looking at the corners of it, right? So this, this is why we need different parameters in hidden layers. And hidden layer nodes process something called an activation function. We'll get to what an activation function is soon. So these hidden as I said, these hidden layers calculate the weighted sum of the features, right? So this number goes here and it calculates the weighted sum, let's say of maybe ages or degrees. So this is like some feature, right? And it does this calculation with something called an activation function, which we talked about from the previous slide. And this weighted sum is added with a bias. And this bias is a constant number. And this is used to adjust the value according to what is, uh, what is the output of the neural network. And all these calculations happen in hidden layers. All the calculations we talked about with the activation function all, this is called feature generation. The really important key point. Okay, so let's look at a small example of what an activation function really looks like, right? We, we talked about weighted, uh, it being a weighted sum, but there are different types of activation functions. So this is one type of activation function, which is called a rectified linear unit, or also known as ReLU, okay? This activation function is really simple. Remember we talked about in natural neural networks and the perceptron that after a certain threshold, it just fires. Same thing happens here. So in, in ReLU, it's, it's the same thing. If it's a negative value, it just removes it. it. It doesn't fire at all. You see that? But only if it's a positive value, it fires. That's basically what, an act, uh, what the activation function is for a rectified uh, linear unit. Yeah. So. Okay, so that, that was an activation function. Now let's look at the output layer. So the output layer receives data from the last hidden layer. So remember I told you it can, there can be more than one hidden layers? Yeah, so it always receives the, uh, the numbers or the input from the last hidden layer. And this is basically the solution stage. And the output layer neurons also process some kind of activation function. I'll tell you why later. And there can be more than one node in the output layer. So yeah, let, let, let's say you're trying to classify between a pen and a pencil, right? Or, or maybe cats and dogs. Yeah, cats and dogs is a better example, right? So when you're processing cats and dogs, what a neural network does is, okay, let, let, let's go to the example, right? So let's say uh, this is maybe, uh, okay, you give a picture of a cat and you give, okay, let's say you give a picture of a, of a cat, right? So what does a cat have that a dog doesn't? Can anyone tell me? Because I'm trying, kind of blanking out here. <laughs> yeah, uh, tell me some uh, differences between cats and dogs in, in, uh, that you can see visually. Anyone? Uh, their eyes. Yeah, eyes. Okay, and? Their, the color of their coat. Okay, and? Color, nose, tail. Yeah, okay, perfect. We only needed three. Okay, yeah, so let's take the ones from the chat, right? Uh, okay, let's take eyes, paws, and nose, right? Okay, so let's say this is eyes, paws, and nose. And what, what we just discovered was features. So these are basically features. And these features are fed into the neural network. But how? Remember we talked about images and how they are converted into uh, numbers uh, of, uh, of the color? Uh, color channels. So yeah, basically we feed them like that. Okay. L let's say this, this was nose uh, and th th this was the value for nose. And this, uh, these were the values for if there was a tail and this was a value for if there was pause, right? Yeah. Okay. So now what it does is it feeds these, each node feeds these values into different hidden layers. And now what this hidden layer does, it does its own calculation with its own activation function. And it tries to add, tries to do the weighted sum like we talked about and what it does is it sends what it had those values 
the next hidden layer. And the next hidden layer can be anything. So it's, it's up to us on what we want our activation functions to be and how we want to process them, right? So this is where the major amount of computation works. And the key point here is activation function. That's what we change. And that's what we handle when we build a neural network, right? And in the end, we get an output, right? Okay, so let me actually uh, draw here. I'd like to show you something. Okay, so here there's only one, right? But we talked about classification with cats and dogs, right? But so what happens when uh, when we have two things that we want to classify, right? Here it, it tells us what it thinks. So it's 89%, okay, let, let, let's say we're trying to classify if we see a stop sign or not, right? We're doing a binary classification here. So when we do a binary classification, this value, this, this neural network works perfectly because it says, okay, I'm 89% sure it's a stop sign, right? But let's say we're classifying cats and dogs, right? So there can be either cats, dogs, or not a cat and dog, right? So that would mean we would have three nodes in our output layer. And each of these, each of these nodes would be connected to each, each of the nodes in the output layer. And how would this work, right? This would mean that we would have, okay, let's say what well, the image that we sent was a, was a dog, right? So let's say this is a dog, right? Uh, so it says, okay, so, okay, let, let's write here, dogs, uh oh, dogs, cat, and uh, not dog, okay? It's gonna write end there. So, so it thinks, oh, I'm 89% sure that it's a dog, but I'm also some percentage sure that it's a cat, and I'm some percent sure that it's not a cat or dog. So it gives you a value for each and every node, but the highest value is what you consider. And the one thing important here is that all the, uh -oh, all these values here add up to one. Okay, yeah, that's it. So now we'll talk about deep learning. Okay, so what is deep learning, right? I should have asked you guys this. Sorry about that, but <laughs> neural network with more hidden layers is basically what deep learning is. So guys, don't don't get confused. Now you guys know what deep learning is. Deep learning is what more hidden layers. That's all. That's all is what deep learning is, no difference, right? And why is deep learning so hard, right? Why, why, why didn't people do deep learning before? Like when AlexNet was there, why didn't just everyone do deep learning, right? That's, that was not possible because when you put more hidden layers, you need more, it involves more math and more computation. And to do more math and computation, you need faster computers. But that was the, re that was the reason why not a lot of people were doing deep learning back then, but now because computation power has increased, more people are doing deep learning and deep learning is uh, getting really famous and it's a hot topic now. So yeah, that's deep learning. And let's look at the types of neural network. Right? It's really important for us. So first we'll take a look at, oh, we'll take a look at feed forward neural networks. Feed forward neural networks are the same kind of neural networks we were talking about before. They're the simplest kind of neural network. And this doesn't form a cycle, okay? We'll talk about what I mean in the next slide about the cycle part. And feed forward neural networks are mostly used in supervision learning cases where data is to be learned and neither sequential nor dependent, okay? Yeah, so now let's talk about a recurrent neural network. This is really interesting. So recurrent neural networks have a short-term memory. Interesting, right? Yeah, we'll know how. It feeds the output of the neural network back into the model as an input. So, and next time you run it. And this process is known as back propagation. And this back propagation is really, really important. We'll, we'll actually uh, talk more about back propagation. I have a small thing that I wanna show you guys. So uh, RNNs or recurrent neural networks, are used to learn uh, used to learn patterns because they have a short term memory. Remember over here, right? And an example of RNN would be words, right? So when, when you're typing words on uh, on the system and uh, uh, you want to know if you made a grammatical error or not, RNNs work perfectly to uh, catch if you misspelled a word or not, and they correct you. 
right? Okay, so this is an image that I found on the internet, which I really thought was uh, worth sharing. So recurrent neural networks, remember we, we talked about all the output layers and then this, this being like um, the end, but recurrent neural networks, no, it doesn't do that. So what it does is, let's say this is Hyro, right? And then Hyro is like, oh, hey, that's not a dog. You classified that wrong, right? You know what it does? Okay, oh, I'm gonna talk about backpropagation. No, okay, let, okay, okay, you know what? We're talking about backpropagation now, okay? I'll talk about this later. So, um, recurrent neural networks uh, are used for tasks uh, that are dependent on a sequence of successful, successive states. And they are trained using backpropagation, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide. Uh, and memory, right? They have a really short-term memory that we saw. And they're really, they're, they're simple, uh, simple recurrent neural networks have a similar form of short-term memory. That's basically it. Yeah, so let's talk about backpropagation. Let me go back here while explaining backpropagation. So yeah, let's go back to the example with Hyro, right? Let's say this is Hyro, and then he's like, oh yeah, hey, you classified that wrong. It's not uh, a it's not a cat, it's a dog, right? So what this neural network does is it's like, okay, go back, let's go back. So it, it feeds this input back into the hidden layers. And then what these hidden layers do is like, oh yeah, oh, sh uh, oh no. Okay, so you did this wrong. Okay, it assigns blame to other nodes, it assigns blame to uh, the previous node. that it, it got the answer wrong. And what, what happens when it assigns blame? Right when when the neurons assign blame, they adjust their weights accordingly to the output. This is how it learns, and the the reason why it has a short term memory is because once back propagation keeps happening, it starts remembering sort of right uh, from its past mistakes. Because once it corrects itself from a mistake it made previously, and it corrects itself again, right? That's already two corrections, so it remembers the previous correction it made. Right? That's why we say that it's a short term memory. And uh, since this information is fed backwards, it's called backpropagation, right? So yeah, this is, this is just a funny thing that I found online, uh, really funny. Okay, yeah, so uh, <laughs> moving on. Yeah, so this is a blank slide. Uh, this is where I wanted to show you guys. Yes, I'll keep, okay, yeah. Where I wanted to show you guys some backpropagation, right? And use of neural networks, right? Okay, so let's say, um, give me some ideas here. So I love, uh dog i'm oh, sorry um dogs are my favorite animal yeah animal right i spelled that wrong correct he immediately corrected it i was on and working okay oh i spelled it wrong too much and mel RNN worked there perfectly, right? That was recurrent neural networks working. Okay, so dogs are my favorite animal, right? Uh, and then let's type some text, right? I love dogs because, and let's give some notes here, because they are playful. And uh, they are loyal. Right, okay. No, this is my slide and this is perfectly done, right? I like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to design ideas. Design ideas is something really cool that I use for my slides here. So I click design ideas and now what's gonna happen when I click design ideas is it's gonna feed this, uh, this slide into its neural network. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, okay, I. It, this neural network, the design ideas neural network is already trained with previous designs that are really good, right? So what it does is it, it takes all this and then look, I'm gonna press that. And then, wow, look, when I said dog, see it read, oh my, I spelled dogs wrong. I'm so sorry, guys. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so when it saw dogs, see it, it gives me a bone, gives me a bone or it gives me paw prints, right? Yeah, okay, so now let's say that we chose this, right? So now what, what, what happens is when we choose this picture, it, it starts adjusting its weights according, okay, so now let's close this, right? So now it adjusts its weights accordingly, saying that, oh, 
he likes this style and he likes this picture, right? Now let's see what happens when we feed this back into design ideas. This is back propagation. Look at, look at that, look. It knows that I like this, uh, this picture and it tries, to, it tries different styles uh, and it tries to incorporate this picture in it. So, it, because it knows that I like this picture, right? So yeah, this is basically how back propagation works. Yeah, let's go back to the slides now. The next type of neural networks is called convolutional neural network. And it's used mainly in image processing. In images, a pixel is affected by all the pixels surrounding it. It's not, it's not sequential data and it's not really simple to, um, to compute all this. So convolutional neural networks or CNNs look at windows of pixels instead of one pixel at a time. And they apply filters to these windows to create features. So convolutional neural network create features, right? And this step is called convolution. That's why they're called convolution. And oh, let me move this back on top. Okay. So the main advantage of using CNNs is that they automatically detect what features are important without human supervision, right? So that's why new, uh, uh, convolutional neural networks are really, really um, like, they're booming right now. A lot of people are using convolutional neural networks, especially for image processing and all those uh, types of things. And the process of uh, network, uh, the, the process of the network uh, determines which window and uh, which windows and filter to use, which helps us get smaller number of features from many pixels. And this process is called pooling, right? So it takes each of these windows and it applies its own features and because it's taking these windows, it, it's able to get a small amount of features from, from each window. And this basically is called pooling. And in, the, uh, and in the end, the network will use these features that it generated on its own and pooling techniques to give us some kind of output. And which is in this case, detecting an image, right? So basically it can detect if it's a stop sign or a human, I don't know if you guys can see my laser pointer, but yeah. And detect if it's a stop sign or a human or a human with a stop sign, right? So like that. And convolutional, so where are convolutional neural networks used in our daily use, right? Convolutional neural networks are used in Snapchat uh, and it's used for image recognition and Google Translate. Uh, CNNs are used to basically translate from language to language. Right? This is why convolutional neural networks are really uh, popular now. But there's a problem, right? All these neural networks and especially all these models, right? The more complex these models become and networks become, in fact, uh, the more data we need to perform uh, with these models, right? Perform well. And data is not so readily available. Like we remember we talked about ImageNet and how um, a lot of people were required to uh, involved to label such images and give them, right? So it's really hard to get data. So how do we get more data without doing so much man labor, right? No matter woman labor. So solution is GANs, GANs, General Adversarial Network, okay? So what are GANs, right? They use existing data and try to learn how to create new data, okay? These are two neural networks working as one. As you see here, there are two guys in one code. So yeah, this is basically how GANs work together. We'll see by a small story how GANs usually work, right? So let's say you wanna make a fake $100 bill, uh, bills by examining other $100 bills, right? And you give it to the cashier and the cashier says, oh, it's fake, right? And then, you ask the cashier, oh, how'd you know it's fake? Okay, and then you find out what the cashier said and then you go back to your lab and correct that mistake and you repeat the step again, right? You again, uh, make uh, you make another $100 bill, give it to the cashier, the cashier finds out that, oh, this is, uh, this is fake, right? And then you ask, her, uh, you ask the person, why? Why do you think it's fake? 
right? And then you understand why it's fake and then you go back and then you keep repeating this. And finally, you'll end up with the, uh, you'll finally end up fooling the cashier and then, then you'll go to jail. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> so uh, this is basically how GANs work. So you in the, um, uh, uh, so us, we're making the $100, fake $100 bill. We are the generator right? And then the cashier here is a discriminator. And the discriminator discriminates between real and fake. So these are two separate neural networks. And these two separate neural networks battle out to create better outputs. And as they keep going through the cycle on and on and on, they keep getting better at what they're doing. And slowly it starts getting trickier for the cashier to uh, realize if this is fake or not, right? So th this is this is basically how GANs work, and people have been using GANs for to create new data because nowadays we're having a lot of data regulations, and uh, data is not that regularly uh, not, not readily available. So uh, use of GANs has increased a lot. Yeah. So that's it for our uh, session today, and the surprise was a Kahoot in the end. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm really excited to, um, to play the Kahoot game with you guys. I, I don't think I'll be playing, but yeah, you guys can join to play. Um, there, there is a surprise in the end. Um, I, I think I can say it. Yeah. So, uh, the the person who wins Kahoot will win a twenty dollar Amazon gift card. So it's worth participating, guys. So yeah, thank you for sticking, uh, sticking on to the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, let me let me share my screen. Let's see what the next slide is. I completely forgot. Yeah, okay, so questions, right? So uh, let, let, let's just have questions for now. Um, as I, uh-oh. Okay, yeah, so this is the Kahoot. Um, let me share sound. I, I love the Kahoot sound. Okay. Um, okay, guys. You can stop the streaming if you want. Uh, oh yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, that's it for YouTube then. Uh, okay, wait, let, let's answer any questions actually. Does anyone have any questions uh, before I stop the recording? So we can end the session um, and the official session for YouTube. You guys have any questions and, or you want me to pull up the slides? You guys can pop out any questions. I'll actually keep uh, the Kahoot open uh, so you guys can like, Check out the code. Oh, there's already one person in. Wow, that was fast. Nice. Okay. Questions, anyone? No questions? Okay. Okay, then. Cool. Yeah. Um, then wait. Yeah. Thank you so much. And this is it for YouTube. Yeah. See you guys.